The financial markets entered bear market territory December of 2018, and all the analysts are calling for a big recession. In this video, we're gonna look at the best money managers in the world and what they do to protect and grow their wealth during these bad times. And you can easily do the same things to protect and grow your wealth, so stay tuned. All right, welcome back. So we are going to talk about a coming financial collapse, but not to be dismayed, we're gonna talk about what we can do to survive it and even thrive through the coming financial crash. So first off, a market crash, is it coming? Well, everybody seems to think so. All the fundamentals are there, so we kinda of know it is, right? Everything is there fundamentally. All the best money managers in the world are calling for it. Ray Dalio, the best money manager in the world from Bridgewater Capital, he's been pounding the table, he's on tour talking about it. If you can look at the chart right here, you can see that we've had two recent uh, bubbles and crashes and now we're like two or three times bigger than the last one. It's coming, the problem is when. You have all these people trying to predict it, but trying to predict the market, trying to time a market is kind of a fool's errand. Some of the things that we do know why this is happening is a couple of things that we'll look at is one, debt. I mean, debt is something that just weighs us down. Debt limits things that we can do. It's like putting giant weights on your back and trying to run. And we have so much debt piling up that it just kills um, creativity, it kills economic output. And we have the US government debt right now. It's continues to grow like a trillion dollars a year. We're up to 22 trillion dollars. The U.S. private debt, this is just private households, is over 22 trillion dollars. We have U.S. student loan is a giant bubble at over 1.5 trillion dollars. The U.S. auto loan is over 1.3 trillion dollars. And then we have U.S. credit card debt. Credit card debt is almost the worst kind of debt. That's over a trillion dollars. And then global debt, the whole world is up to almost 250 trillion dollars. Now, that is three times GDP. Now, if you don't know what GDP is, that's gross domestic product. That's the entire output of the entire world. So the debt is three times all the output of the entire world. It's just crazy. I mean, if that doesn't tell us what the future holds, then I don't know what does. Now, to put things into a little bit of perspective, in 2008, things were bad, right? Uh, if you lived through that, you know, for me, it was really bad if you've heard my story. But in 2008, we saw this massive crash and it was really triggered by the housing crisis. So we had all these houses go bankrupt and it caused all these banks to fail and the government had to step in. And bad as that was, it was triggered by the housing debt and it was about 800 billion. Oh my God! Oh my God! Today, we have three bubbles, each bigger. So that was 800 billion. We have 1.5 in student loans. We have 1.3 in auto loans. We have 1 trillion in, in credit card debt. Each one is bigger than just that one. So if that one in 2008 could cause that damage, what are these three gonna cause? Auto loans, for example, the majority of those auto loans are subprime. That means people that have really bad credit. And at least with homes, you're gonna try and keep that home as, as long as you can. With cars, you give it back, it's worthless. And the student loan debt, not only is it bad from a sense where like the the, Mortgage debt was at least banks that had to absorb that. Student loan debt is the government. As a matter of fact, the largest asset on the U.S. government's books is student loan debt. Mind-bottling, isn't it? Did you just say mind-bottling? Yeah, mind-bottling. You know, when things are so crazy, it gets your thoughts all trapped like in a bottle. Really what we have is a fake economy. We've had a fake economy. That's why each bubble continues to get worse and worse. That's why, you know, we've recovered from the 2008 crisis, but things have gotten way worse today. And what I mean by a fake economy is that it wasn't built by saving and deploying capital. What it was, it was built on credit and fake money. We've issued all this credit, all this debt, and we've printed trillions of dollars at the same time. And to make matters worse, the government, the US government has been under this, and not just the US government, lots of the big governments around the world are um, doing what they call QE. You might've heard of it, but you may not understand what it is. It's called quantitative easing. And basically what they're doing is central banks are buying financial assets in order to stimulate the economy. Where do the central bank get their money? They print it, they counterfeit it, right? They just make it. You think the stock market's doing really good? Well, because they have somebody buying them all, but who's buying them all? 
the central bank. Mind bottling, isn't it? It's like a big house of cards. On top of that, they've artificially lowered the interest rates down to next to nothing, the lowest that they've ever been. And so what happens is then with money next to nothing, and you have all these financial institutions getting this money basically for free, and then they use that fake money, that credit money that they're paying nothing on, and they start buying back their stock. When they start buying back their stock, the price of the stock goes up. So they're borrowing fake money to buy their stock to make their stock go up, and their stock goes up, they get giant bonuses, the companies are basically left with nothing, now they're left with a bunch of debt, that's kind of worthless. Today, it was announced two of the larger banks in the US are merging, so we see all these mergers. Elon Musk with his company with SpaceX and Tesla. Tesla's going bankrupt, so then you know it's gonna be merged with SpaceX. So all these mergers and acquisitions are just more ways that fake money, the fake economy is, is working. Statistically speaking, we have bull markets, which are up markets, and we have bear markets, which are down markets, and we are in the second oldest bull market on record, so it was the longest one, and we actually just entered bear market territory territory in December, but things are kind of switched around. And what happened is the Fed started to raise their interest rates. Like I said, they've been kept artificially low and they've started to raise them. And of course, things started slowing down. And now what they've done is they've paused the raise. Raising the rates isn't the problem. What, what seems to always proceed another crash is when the Fed has kept rates low, they start to raise them to bring them back up to normal. They realize it's not working and they reverse course. So that's one thing that we're watching for. It's only one sign. It's not in itself is conclusive, but watch for that. As soon as you see the feds decide to lower rates again, that's a bad sign. In 2000, we had the NASDAQ crash. That was the dot-com bubble, the dot-com crash. And we had about 80% wiped out across the board. Some did a lot worse. $6.5 trillion gone. <laughs> 6.5 trillion, phew, gone. And the tech stocks, they're all on that NASDAQ, they all plunged. In 2008, in that financial crash we just talked about, we kind of saw the same thing. We saw 3.3 trillion in home equity wiped out. So a lot of people felt really rich because all of a sudden their homes had appreciated and they had all this equity. A lot of people then were tapping into that equity to buy boats and to buy second homes and buy cars and things like that. Well, we saw 3.3 trillion wiped out instantly out of home equity, which made everybody feel a lot more poor. And then the stock stock market lost $7 trillion. $7 trillion was gone. One fifth of the world's GDP. That's what the last two crashes were. And like I said, the bubbles that we're facing today are even worse. What are we gonna do? I'm not just trying to scare you guys. What I wanna do is I wanna make a plan. I wanna promote some hope here. So what are we gonna do? Success leaves clues. We look for who are the best money managers? Who are the smartest people out there? What are they doing? Then we need to make a plan, we prepare, and then we use allocation and diversification. Now, I have a picture of Tony Robbins' book, Money, Master the Game, on the screen. And it's a great book. I highly recommend anybody to read it. And what he did, because he's got a lot of access to everybody, is he went and he actually interviewed the best money manager in the world. And he asked him this exact question. If a financial crash is coming, we kind of know it's coming, what should we do? And you can see what the best money managers in the world all said. If you're liking this video, give me some thumbs up. I'm not leaving with doom and gloom, we have some hope. So give me some thumbs up. If you don't like it, just give me some thumbs down either way. And of course, leave me your comments. I love to answer your comments in the discussion down below. So we're going to look at the best money managers in the world and what they're doing is they're allocating their assets. It's the number one rule for success with investing. The number one rule for success with investing is asset allocation. If you've watched my videos, you've probably heard my story. I lost everything in the 2008 crash because I didn't understand asset allocation. I had all my assets in one asset class and I lost everything. I can't really pound the table on this one enough. You need to practice asset allocation. And what you do is you allocate your assets, you divide your assets up into what's called non-correlated assets. So that means if one goes down, another one goes up. So some things that you can look at that have done well in previous crashes is quality bonds. Quality bonds have done really well government bonds are part of that. Junk bonds have done really bad. So I say quality bonds, government bonds, US treasuries did really good, cash. So when, when debt deleveraging is happening, um, cash does really good. So cash is a good place to be, US treasuries is a good place to be. ETFs are good, but reverse ETFs. So basically it's a way that you could short um, the whole market. During the last couple of crashes, developing markets did really well. So being in China, being in India, places like that, 
did really well. So look for developing markets. Managed futures are another way that you can hedge your bets, hedge your portfolios. REITs didn't do too well in 2008 because it was a housing crash, but in 2000, REITs did really, really well. That's a real estate investment trust. Gold has done really well through all the crashes. In 2008, it also took a hit. However, it bounced back right away compared to what the stocks took a hit. And then of course we have Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. We don't have enough history to know how they're gonna do in a crash because they haven't been through a crash yet. However, from some of the best analysts in the market today, they say that Bitcoin has proven to be non-correlated or uncorrelated. And as a matter of fact, just from the last couple downturns over the last like year, we've seen that when the stock market's taken big hits, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have actually gone up. Allocate or divide up your capital into non-correlated assets, and those are a couple ones that do that. Now, why do we want to do this? Now, it may sound obvious, but the first reason why we want to do this is we want to protect our wealth, right? It's really hard to make money, and losing it is asymmetric. When I lose money, if I lose 50% of my wealth, I have to make back 100 just to get back to even. I don't wanna lose 50% and make back 100, so I need to protect what I have at all costs. And then I wanna allocate so I can grow my wealth. So I wanna protect it and I wanna grow it, and that's why we use this strategy. So the first way that we're gonna do is through diversification. So we're gonna protect our wealth through diversification. And the reason why this is important is we wanna have exposure to different assets. If the dollar crashes, I wanna make sure that I have exposure to gold because that's gonna be a good chaos hedge. Also, I want exposure to some higher risk ones that might go up bigger. I wanna be able to protect against the total loss. Like I said, in 2008, I didn't know this and I had all my assets in real estate and I lost everything. You wanna protect against the total loss. If you lose 10%, 20%, 30%, even 50%, you can come back from it. When you lose everything, it's obviously devastating as you might imagine. Cap the downside. So like I said, it, it, it is our whole portfolio. So even if I lost everything in real estate, but it only made up 20% of my portfolio, maybe another part of my portfolio did better. I picked up 10% here. So maybe I only lost five or 10% of my total portfolio, even though I lost all my real estate. The other reason why we want to diversify and allocate is not to protect, but to grow our wealth. So we want to be able to take advantage of other opportunities that are out there. And so through asset allocation and diversification, we can grow our wealth a lot faster. So one way is it allows us to safely take risks. So for example, um, you know, I talked about Lyft, they're about to have an IPO. Or you heard about this new battery company or this new oil company. Well, this new oil company that I invested into could potentially return 50 times to me. That's a huge upside. However, there's risk there as well. I could lose everything. So what I'll do is I'll take a little piece of my portfolio, maybe I'll take 10% or 20% of my total portfolio, and that's my risky stuff. I'm taking moonshots with that. That way I can get the upside. That 5% could turn into 100%, but I'm only risking 5%. So I can safely play other things, more risky things that have more upside, but still limit my downside. If you could have had a big pile of cash in 2009 or 2001, you would have had the sale of a lifetime. That is when money is made, is buying at 2009, buying at 2001, buying at the bottom of that big crash. There's a book that I have here, it's called um, The Sale of a Lifetime. And he talks about you know, this, this coming crash and all these different assets that are gonna be on sale. So we wanna protect our wealth. We don't wanna lose it, we wanna grow it and then we wanna be able to use allocation strategies so we can do more risky things to get more upside and we can make sure we have capital so when we do see the sell of a lifetime, we can pounce. How do we do this? How do we allocate? So the first thing you have to do is you have to figure out what is your total investable assets? If I add up, not my house, but like all my liquid assets, what is that? Is that 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, 100 million, whatever that is, and then I wanna divide it up broken up into percentages. We don't care about dollars. I, I really wanna think about my age, so what's my time horizon, how long till retirement, what my income level is, what my tolerance for risk is. You wanna make a list of all these non-correlated assets and make sure that you're dividing up your portfolio into non-correlating assets. And then you really wanna break them down based off of risk factor. For long-term investments, I would never put more than 5% of my total portfolio at risk. I really wouldn't put more than 5% of my allocation. So if I decided I was gonna put 30% of my portfolio into these risky investments, I would never risk more than 5% of that 30% allocation, if that makes sense. And then you want to rebalance that regularly. So 
you know, once a quarter, twice a year, once a year, you're going to see that the original 20%, 30%, 50% has changed, right? Some have gone up, some have gone down. And so you want to rebalance that. That's a really quick overview on this. It's a lot deeper of a subject than that. And that's about all I can get into on this video. However, I put together a free guide for you. So I have a guide that really kind of walks you through this. And I actually put together um, a few different uh, portfolios. So it'll give you all the um, asset allocation basics. It'll show you how to find these non correlated assets and it's going to walk you through how to build your perfect portfolio super super powerful like i said i believe it's the number one rule for investing is asset allocation so you got to do it it's an unfair advantage to people that aren't paying attention they don't know this i lost everything people that knew how to protect their assets were able to come and buy my assets for pennies on the dollar and they made all the money and i lost it if you like this video give me some thumbs up if you don't like it give me some thumbs down tell me why Leave a comment, tell me what you're allocating into what non-correlated assets you like, and I hope to hear from you there. That's it, to your success, I'm out.